crisis or creativity, an attempt to explain the beginnings of philosophical creativity. Let us assume from the beginning that crisis is the mother of creativity and that it is behind everything new and different, in fact different from what preceded it in philosophy and in non-philosophy. But crisis is a broad concept with many dimensions and it is at risk of a subjective view of it, such that your vision of the crisis differs from my vision or someone else's vision, and I do not rule out that the phrase that was given the title of this article could be accused of being a vulgar constructionist or a dreamy sentimentalist in a field that only allows strict, accurate knowledge. In order not to get lost together in the maze of questions about the meaning of the crisis and the forms that can express it in the philosopher's approach, his intellectual system, or the historical and social moment in which he lives, I hasten to limit the concept of crisis to the problem of contradiction in its two parts, logical dialectical and temporal historical. However, the contradiction is not an easy problem and it must be understood in a way that allows the interpretation of the creative and good and philosophical thought that is described as novelty and creativity. Here, too, there are multiple concepts of contradiction common sense or the natural and practical position of the average person has rejected it since ancient times and will continue to reject it, and the old formal logic with the philosophical doctrines that were based on it directly or indirectly from Plato and Aristotle in the 4th century BC until Kant in the 18th century. It has done everything in its power to exclude and avoid it, rather, it has made it a sign of inconsistency and defect and the source of mistakes, fallacies, contradictions and paradoxes that require consistent thought that is free of contradiction. To fight it and avoid it point one but what is important in this context is that the crisis manifested itself in different ways for the creative philosopher in the contradiction that he felt existed, knew, and started from. It was the engine and impetus for the establishment of his philosophy, the novelty and originality of which no one disputes. Perhaps we differed in opinion about the name of the philosopher that each of us could cite and perhaps the pen trembled in my hand and behind it the heart and he tried to lead me to a number of thinkers poets in the history of philosophy and literature among those whom I like to call saviors, or to some of the philosophers whom Jaspers described as the great awakeners, first among them Pascal, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche, among the pioneers of contemporary philosophy, but I will limit my discussion in this limited field to four modern philosophers, namely Descartes, Kant, Hegel, and Husserl, for whom the crisis of contradiction was behind their creativity for their original approaches. I will precede the events and say in general that Descartes, 1596 to 1650 AD, saw the contradiction which he tried to raise and get rid of in the confusion of thought with itself. He doubted everything and yet he could not doubt everything. I mean that he had no choice but to prove the truth of the existence of thought and its certainty during and through doubt itself, then he moved on to prove the existence of the thinking ego and the certainty of its simplicity, its distinction from the body and its immortality, to the last thing that is known and famous from Descartes' philosophy. As for Kant, 1724 to 1804 AD, he started from his knowledge based on his belief in the stability and validity of Aristotelian logic. That contradiction is an appearance and a deceptive illusion among the illusions of pure reason. Then he explained that the contradictions of knowledge and contradictions into which this mind falls are due to its ambition to know the absolute without an experimental basis or concrete ones based on them, they are borderline or final phenomena of knowledge that should be avoided. If we want philosophy to be critical and scientific with general honesty, then Hegel, 1770 to 1831 AD comes and behind him is a procession of dialecticians with different perceptions of the essence of dialectic and its forms and he confirms that contradiction exists, that it is an essential element of knowledge and a tremendous driver of all thought and reality. Indeed, he makes it the spirit of the dialectical method, which he claimed to be the scientific method. The only one, and he wanted him to impose the previous approaches and throw them into the abyss of death, wear and tear, and oblivion, and that is if we want philosophy to shed its old name, which is the love of wisdom, and become truly scientific. Finally, Husserl 1859-1938 AD, the author of the philosophy of phenomenology or phenomenology and the founder of its method comes and reveals the contradictions of psychological tendency in logic and mathematics and exposes its dangerous relativity. Then he soon emerges from this contradiction to believe in the truth and objectivity of thought and repeat his famous call. Let us return to the same topics, or rather, let us revive its objective facts and established essence, as if we see them with our own eyes, the contradiction, or rather the self-contradiction from which Descartes started in his search for method and in constructing the integrated structure of his philosophy, lies in the famous evidence of doubt. 
This is the evidence that led him to reach his first certainty, which he formulated in a phrase that has long been subjected to criticism and has many variations and jokes, I think, therefore I exist. We ask the reader's permission to limit our discussion to his experience with doubt and to this evidence in his book Meditations, in which he presented his ideas with an endearing simplicity that brings them close to direct confession and in a manner so precise, concise, and decisive that we will not find a parallel thereafter in the entire history of philosophy. Perhaps the best way to present the evidence of doubt is the method of Descartes himself in the first and second meditations. He defines his task at the beginning of the first meditation by stating his intention to find a safe method in philosophy and at the same time his awareness or knowledge is confirmed that he has always been vulnerable to error and deception, therefore, he was determined from the beginning not to accept anything as true unless it became clear to him that it was absolutely certain, reliable, and beyond doubt. He noticed to himself from his early youth that he used to take falsehood for truth and that most of what he built on this flimsy foundation was for this reason unsafe and unsafe, that is why he resolved to make a completely new beginning and he would not be able to do this until he discarded all the opinions he had inherited, the facts and information he had received, and until he doubted everything that he found reason to doubt, and so everything begins to doubt in the senses and the veracity of their perceptions, in the existence of his body and the existence of the external Internal world in the simplest mathematical facts, and finally, doubt extends implicitly and timidly to the existence of God himself as the source of all truth. Our friend began with complete and absolute doubt, then, and his intention was that nothing would stop him, and that he would not exclude anything that claimed to exist for itself, even if it was his very existence. Then the second meditation begins by confirming the comprehensive nature of this doubt, and asks a question that directs the movement of his thought in a new direction. If it is assumed that everything is false and deceptive, is there nothing true or true, could it be this one thing? which is that nothing is certain. This attempted answer to his question involves a negative determination of the truth and sums up the results of his final decisive doubt. Assuming that the senses deceive me and that there is nothing in the world and that an evil spirit or a cunning genie has been deceiving me and causing me to err whenever I imagine that I have found the truth, then there must still be something beyond doubt and I will not be able to, while I doubt it, everything to doubt that I doubt. Descartes goes on in his self-reflection, or in his negative thought reflecting on himself, to say that nothing I had previously assumed is capable of making me nothing, for I must be present in some way while I am doubting or thinking, because doubt is a type of thinking. I must also exist so that the cunning genie can deceive me or whisper to me that I do not exist and he will not be able to make me not exist as long as I think that I am something that exists. If through my absolute doubt, I turn towards the same doubt, I would find that I am or exist, it was as if my inability to doubt my doubt had shifted my thinking from negative to positive put an end to my basic argument for doubt and brought me to the statement that I said in the second meditation, that I am and that I exist is something necessarily true whenever I utter it or perceive it with my mind. Thus, I have moved from negative or subjective thinking to objective thinking or objective knowledge, with which I found the basic philosophical topic, and the first certainty from which I will start, which is what was then crystallized in my famous phrase, I think, therefore I exist. Too. Thus, the evidence of doubt involved more than one transformation, from doubt to thinking, and from this to existence, I am, and I exist. Descartes began it by recognizing the possibility of error and deception in a comprehensive manner, and recognizing this possibility, and being aware of it, led him to experience complete and comprehensive doubt, which applies to everything and is not stopped by anything. With the beginning of the experiment, the first transformation appeared. Doubt failed in everything when it turned back on itself, and it became clear as we have seen that it cannot extend to thought, that is, when he was unable to doubt the doubt that applied to himself, he cancelled himself or raised it, as those with dialectical logic say. This is how the shift from negative to positive took place, that is, from doubting everything to the thinking that broke away from it and remained outside its circle. Then, with the development of the experience, a new transformation began that resulted in a new starting point, which was proving the existence of the ego after proving the existence of thought. As long as I think, I exist. If we wanted to put the previous changes in the form of rulings, the evidence of doubt would be divided into these three rulings. A doubt can relate to everything. B doubt cannot relate to thinking, C I exist is necessarily true as long as I think about it, perhaps we thought as did some of Descartes critics whom he responded to in his first and second set of R E S P O N S, 
b s 3 that the previous tripartite structure of judgments takes the form of a formal analogy and that the path of negative experience is a type of deduction however descartes rejected this interpretation it is true that he wanted the evidence of doubt to be evidence but he denounced it being understood as standard evidence here we approach the circle of dialectical thinking which we tried to enter gently and cautiously the truth is that everything so far justifies from an objective standpoint that we imagine the evidence in a dialectical non-measurable way so that we make the first ruling an issue and the second its opposite. However, the problem lies in the third ruling. We do not find a clear composition in it, as required by dialectical logic. In addition to this the hour of the Hegelian dialectic had not yet struck. Is it permissible for us to attribute to Descartes something that he did not think about, or that the composition of the evidence and the spirit of the era did not allow? If the movement of thought in this evidence does not enter into a formal or dialectical logical structure, then how do we understand the character of negativity that prevails in it, through which Descartes discovered the Archimedes point, from which he will proceed to evaluate his approach and formulate his standards of truth and certainty? which are the famous clarity and distinction, which he relied on them to invalidate comprehensive doubt and prove its impossibility, and he also starts from them to prove the certainty of the others, namely, the existence of God, then the existence of the world, in a way that, in the opinion of his critics, was not devoid of the remnants of intermediate traditions, and was not free from affectation and artificiality. It is not our purpose to enter into the details of the renewed criticism of the Cartesian Cogito from his days to the present day, nor do we intend to make Descartes a dialectician in spite of him or with his consent. What is important to us is the intellectual movement that turned from negative to positive and from a contradiction of thought with itself to an elevation of this contradiction and then to overcome a logical and historical crisis by depositing a method and philosophy in which the freedom of the Renaissance man was crystallized and his will, which was determined to discover the truth from within himself and with his abilities independent of all authority or tradition, and went on to welcome a new era and a new thought in science that did not pay attention to the darkness that they left him behind. It was not a coincidence that Descartes asserted that he did not acquire the a priori cogito ergism, I think, therefore I exist, through any logical or synthetic path point. For if we understood his evidence as an analogy, we would have missed his intellectual movement, and perhaps we would have also missed the entire movement of modern thought in the Renaissance. Descartes himself made it clear that doubt about everything limits doubt itself, and that this limitation leads to the recognition of the existence of the thinking ego. Therefore, the strength of the evidence lies in a kind of strange connection that differs from formal logic and traditional analogy and leads from the first ruling to the following two rulings. The link here is different from the analogy in which two rulings are linked and a third ruling is deduced through an intermediate term. We only have one concept in the evidence of doubt, which represents the content of its three rulings. This concept is thought itself. Descartes puts this thought as an experiment in the form of negative or negative thinking. I mean in the form of doubt about everything. It was expected that this decisive doubt would lead to nothingness, but it results through reflective self-reflection and in accordance with the desire to exclude contradiction from a strange experience or from a strange thing, that there is one thing to be excluded from, neither my act of doubt, nor the error and deception of a resourceful deceiver, can nullify the existence of doubt as thought. Then the concept of doubt is divided here into the act of doubt and its object, to specific thinking and a topic on which this thinking focuses. Here the impossibility of doubt becomes evident and doubt itself is thinking, and the existence of thought emerges from the darkness of doubt in its nihilistic fog. Then this different understanding or concept of doubt undergoes a new transformation, as the ego emerges from it after it becomes thinking, and is distinguish from it, because thinking as Descartes imagined, right or wrong cannot be right without the existence of a thinking ego. Since both doubt and deception are unable to prevent me from thinking, the ego must be included in this thinking. Descartes was able to formulate his concept or intellectual experiment with its three steps, from doubting everything, to contradicting this doubt with itself, to proving the existence of thought to which he that is, doubt could not extend, in the form of an analogy of this type. Doubt is thinking. All thinking is a function of the ego. Therefore, doubt is a function of the ego and its existence is assumed. He could have put the cogito in the form of another analogy, as the logical philosopher and mathematician Heinrich Schultz, 1884-1956 AD, did, every time I think, I exist, I'm thinking now, I exist now.5. 
However, these and similar standard forms cannot be a substitute for evidence of doubt, this is because it ignores the type of connection that it entails and it differs as previously said from it in any known form of measurement. Because the negative experience of doubt has abolished itself and its self-contradiction has been raised as we have seen in a dialectical manner that is beyond doubt or suspicion. Whether this is a dialectic of the aphoristic type or not, the dialectic of doubt or comprehensive negative criticism on the threshold of the modern age is historically and factually sufficient testimony to the freedom of modern European man which he never lost afterwards, as Schelling said of Descartes, and perhaps it also indirectly testifies to his creative ability to confront the historical and cultural crisis that he suffered and emerged from, and since then he has proceeded on the path of controlling the inner and outer, I mean on himself and on all nature. What is important in this context is that he lived the experience of crisis and contradiction through negative self-reflection, in which the thinking of his philosopher Descartes was reflected on himself, and he expressed with his intellectual and cognitive experience the experience of modern man who shook himself off the shackles of ancient adage and took the first positive step on the long path of modernity. It is a path whose crises and contradictions have not ended and its call to confronting them with courage, boldness, and honesty will not end. That is, the adventure of constantly creating oneself and existing. Is there a way to creativity except through continuous intellectual movement between the poles of negative and positive and through a crisis of contradiction? that is lifted for a while in order to generate a new crisis of contradiction, that in turn requires creativity of a new kind? Did not the intellectual movement, launched by Descartes for the first time, go beyond Aristotle's formal logic and the mentality of the Middle Ages to a new thought that had to wait more than a century to find its dialectical image at the hands of Hegel and his followers, who were pioneers of the modern era and modern philosophy? Did the founder of modern philosophy start, as its father, from contradiction? Did the philosopher of critical idealism start his search for the transcendental approach, i.e., conditionalism related to the initial or a priori conditions and principles of knowledge from a crisis that manifested itself in the form of a contradiction that disturbed him and motivated him to seek a positive solution to his negative, mind-destroying problem? What is the starting point for his critical approach with which he tested the possibility of philosophy, eventually becoming an accurate and reliable science like all other sciences, natural and mathematical, worthy of respect? The matter seems more difficult with Kant than it was with Descartes, and than it will be with Husserl, whose research on method developed, and their attempts to establish it in a clear, natural line. The structure of the major critical book of Kant and of all modern philosophy, which is critique of pure reason, is a very complex structure. It is possible, in the opinion of some historians and scholars, that Kant really started from the result he reached from his efforts that he made over several years to find a way out of the crisis and a solution to the contradiction, although the arrangement of the book's chapters does not reveal this easily. The explanation for this is that the important chapter in which the contradictions of pure reason are exposed, which is known under the title of Transcendental Dialectic or Transcendental Dialectics came at the end of the book and occupied more than 300 pages, and it should have begun with it, because it is the true starting point for his entire critical philosophy. But what happened is that Kant put the latest findings of the development of his thinking on the entire crisis at the beginning of the book, which is the Chartist theory, in which he presented his original theory of the intuitions of space and time, which are the conditions for all sight or perception. Sensory in its inherent framework, while well, he delayed the beginning of his methodological thinking, as we said, in a way that might lead one to think that it was the result of his search for method and it is in fact its starting point and trigger, so to speak. We will then assume that this possibility is true, even if the complexity of the structure of the famous book does not suggest it. This assumption is supported by an important letter written by Kant to his contemporary, the popular philosopher Christian Jarfa, 1742-1789 AD, and mentioned by the well-known historian of modern philosophy Ben Erdman, in a study.6 in it, he affirmed that transcendental idealism was not the idea on which Kant's main book was based, but rather the contradictions into which pure reason falls due to its flight beyond the limits of possible experience and its reckless ambition to achieve its absolute and transcendent ideals, such as the existence of God and the immortality of the soul etc and to prove their validity and necessity based on his abstract contemplative powers alone. 
In the aforementioned letter Kant expressed that the fact of the existence of contradictions was what motivated his thinking and he said literally, the investigation into the existence of God and the immortality of the soul etc. was not the point from which I started, rather it was the opposite of pure reason which says in one of its ends that the world has a beginning and on its opposite side it says the world has no beginning etc. until the fourth antithesis which proves the existence of human freedom once and denies its existence another time affirming that everything in it, i.e. in man, is subject to natural necessity. It was this antithesis that began, by awakening me from the dogmatic slumber, i.e. the tendency to categorical and rigid assertion without support from experience, and pushing me to criticize reason itself, this is in order to eliminate the scandal of the mind's apparent contradiction with itself.7. It is clear from this text that the idea from which Kant started to form his critical approach, or if you like, to create it, is largely consistent with the idea from which Descartes started and then Husserl after him, as we will see in the last part of this article, they all came from the same source. The source is the thought that contradicts itself, which is the contradiction or contradictions that appear in certain cognitive contexts, so the philosopher enters into a conflict with them, investigates their meanings, and tries to explain them and get out of them, led by the belief based on the principles of formal logic, that true knowledge and precise, precise science are not consistent with the contradiction, then the wheel of searching for a new approach capable of eliminating this contradiction begins to turn. Here this question imposes itself, is this one contradiction that the mind falls into, or is it more than one contradiction? Does the mind create it willingly or without its will? Kant declares that it is not a single contradiction, but a whole system of sight-blinding deceptions, closely related to each other, and united under common principles. Point eight. If we ask, how does this contradiction or complete system arise from contradictions, we find several answers revolving around one axis and going back to one origin. Contradictions do not arise, except when the phenomena or the world of sense that includes them all are taken as things in themselves, and they are not, in the Kantian term, phenomena, but rather they are appearances and illusions, and in origin, they do not arise from experience, or from sight.9 Sensory perception is not about phenomena, but rather the human mind itself creates it when it is driven, by virtue of its natural inclination, to go beyond the world of experience, or as Kant put it, to go beyond experimental use.10 then they are natural illusions that are inevitable and there is no way to avoid them.11 because it is due to the nature of the mind itself in its tendency to transcend the world of experience. He likens these illusions to different types of optical illusions that afflict us for example when the surface of the water in the middle of the sea appears as if it is not higher than its surface on the beach or when the moon during its rise appears smaller than it actually is and as we must in such cases. It is difficult for us to misperceive things and it is also difficult for us to avoid falling into the illusion of the transcendental appearance and its deception. The matter here is related to a kind of dialectic or argument that clings to the human mind in a necessary and inevitable way. Rather, after we reveal its deception that blinds the sight, it does not stop deceiving the mind and does not stop throwing it every moment into types of delusion that you always need to get rid of them.12. Thus we find that the contradictions of the mind are of a special nature, they do not arise by the will of the mind, as is the case for example, with the famous contradiction about the square circle, when I arbitrarily combine the concept of the square with the concept of the circle, and then they, i.e. the contradictions of the mind, do not arise from reality. Because as he emphasized in his comparison to types of optical illusions, they are intellectual illusions of various forms. In this limited field, we will not be able to follow Kant's explanation of the contradictions of pure reason, as he presented it in the section on transcendental debate in the form of a detailed table of the various contradictions and the arguments in support of their opposing sides, the world has a beginning in time, or the world is ancient and has no beginning, the essence consists of infinite parts or finitude, the assumption of a necessary being or its non-existence, the assumption of human freedom or determinism, etc. What concerns us in this regard is the crisis sparked by the existence of contradiction indeed, its scandal, as he put it more than once. In Kant's thinking and the seriousness that made him take upon himself the burden of ridding the modern mind of its dangers and warning it of the pits of deterioration in it, and the previous letter that he wrote to Jurifa attests to this, as does the continuous complaint about the existence of contradiction. It is enough to listen to this sad tone that he repeats in Critique of Pure Reason and other of his writings. Let us feel the extent of his pity for the fate of modern man if he surrenders to the contradictions embedded in his mental nature. 
The presence of contradiction in general in the pure mind is something that causes feelings of depression and frustration, and it is also sad for this mind to fall into conflict with itself even though it represents the highest court that decides on all disputes. Point one three. It is a disappointment and disappointment to the human mind that it does not achieve anything through its pure, pure use, but rather that it needs in addition to that a system that curbs its wanderings and spares it the causes of deception that drag it upon it and blind its sight. Point one four. This negative contradiction or scandal into which the mind falls by its nature is the motivation and starting point for the formation and development of the critical approach. If we accept the previous assumption that the transcendental debate in which Kant analyzes and criticizes contradictions is the true beginning of his entire critical doctrine in his book The Critique of Pure Reason, then it must be said that this negative or non-objective criticism, i.e., not linked to a topic, reminds us of the evidence of doubt, according to Descartes and his experience in reflective self-reflection, where Kant was able to emerge from his negative analysis of contradictions with a positive and objective approach in criticizing knowledge and determining its limits, that is, in the human mind's criticism of itself, and here he continues after the last text in which he emphasized the mind's need for a system that curbs its whims. He says, however, what increases his, i.e. the mind's, confidence and pride is for him to be able to implement this system himself and to feel its necessity without allowing any other party to practice it supervising him, and that the limits which he is forced to place to limit his abstract contemplative use should also be able to limit the allegations raised by any opponent and clothe them in an artificial mental guise, and in addition to this to secure all the remainder of his previous exaggerated demands from every possible attack. Thus, reason confirms its existence when it applies the system of criticism and it also proves that it is impossible for the supreme court of all the rights, aspirations, and ambitions of our abstract contemplation to contain any of the innate forms of fraud and deception that blind the sight.15. Thus, criticizing the whims of pure reason to prove its absolute, transcendent ideals and truths, without any experimental and scientific support, as previously mentioned, that is, criticizing the errors and contradictions in which it falls, leads to the mind's knowledge of itself in the same way that Descartes' experience of doubt led to his self-certainty. Hence, Kant places the methodological unity of the critical mind's thinking against the contradictions of metaphysical thinking, and he also places the inner unity of the mind itself against the unity of the world that the contemplative mind was unable to reach. If Descartes' experience proved that the ego remains present within doubt about everything and that it gives itself a negative gift in it, then Kant's mind also experiences its self-certainty through negation. The negative character of the whole critical process is evident in this statement. It follows that the greatest benefit offered by the philosophy of pure reason, and perhaps the only benefit from it, is only negative, this is because it, i.e. the philosophy of pure reason, is not a tool suitable for expansion of knowledge, but rather it is a system suitable for setting boundaries. Instead of giving herself credit for discovering the truth, her credit is limited to quietly protecting herself from making mistakes.16 it is true that Kant did not simplify for us the method for the emergence of his positive methodological positions step by step as Descartes did, but in any case, he described the relationship of his approach to contradiction accurately in the introduction to the second edition of his book Critique of Pure Reason, where he says 17 the method adopted by students of the natural sciences consists of searching for the elements of pure reason and what can be confirmed or refuted by experiment. However, the issues of pure reason, especially when they risk exceeding all the limits of possible experience, do not permit any experiment to be conducted with their subjects, as is the case in natural science, to test these issues, therefore, we will only be able to make this choice on concepts and principles that we acknowledge a priori and address, so that these same topics can be looked at from two different points of view so that they are, on the one hand topics for the senses and understanding related to experience, and on the other hand topics that are sufficient to think about as topics for the pure, isolated mind, who strives best to transcend beyond experience. If we find that looking at things from this dual point of view leads to agreement with the principle of pure reason and that looking at them from a single point of view inevitably leads to the mind conflicting with itself, experience is what will determine the validity of this distinction. This text describes the process of criticizing pure reason as an experiment. It is an experiment different in nature from the experiments carried out in the natural sciences. Because it does not apply to subjects in the concrete conventional sense of this word, therefore, it was in fact a subjective experiment 
experience carried out by the mind on itself. Experience in this sense has two parts. One is negative resulting in the mind's struggle or conflict with itself, the other is positive, in which there is harmony with the principle of pure reason. It is clear that the negative side of the experience carries in its multiples the positive side, that is, resolving the contradiction requires that pure reason establish that principle that obliges it, i.e. reason, to agree with it. Therefore, the mind must find its principle and agree with it, in order to be able to get rid of its scandal, that was brought upon it by its push beyond the limits of possible experience, and its tendency to wonder unlimitedly about unlimited matters, God, freedom, eternity the finitude or infinity of the world and time, etc. Dot. Does all of this have anything other than one name, which is the mind's definition of its limits, or in other words, the criticism of the mind? Does the path that the mind follows in its investigation of these contradictions lead only to insight into its own principle? It is true that the matter here will not be similar to the sudden appearance of ego certainty from the depths of comprehensive doubt, as happened with Descartes, because careful and careful thinking about all the mistakes and misguidance of the mind is what will allow one to see its true face and know its true essence. Therefore, this image that Kant describes at the conclusion of his book will not arise before us except after an in-depth critical review of the negative capabilities of the mind, our mind may not be likened to a flat surface, whose vast area cannot be defined, so that it is only known that it deviates from definition, but rather it must be likened to a spherical shape. Its radius can be determined by means of a curved line on its surface, i.e., according to the nature of the a priori compositional issues, and its content and boundaries can also be determined in a certain way. But outside the spherical shape, i.e. outside the field of experience, there is nothing for which it can be considered a subject. The questions that are asked about such so-called topics will not address the subjective principles of precisely determining the relationships that can exist within the spherical shape between the concepts of the understanding or mind.18. There is no doubt that the previous statement despite its Kantian difficulty, we have been presented with a vivid image of a specific spherical shape in contrast to a flat surface that is impossible to define due to its extreme breadth, and the mind is the spherical shape that is determined by a priori compositional propositions, which Kant's reader knows are the condition for the establishment of science, had it not been available in the natural and mathematical sciences, they would not have become sciences. Strictly speaking, the curved line also determines the radius of the circle. As for what falls outside this circle, it does not belong to the mind and is not subject to its principle, which is also determined by a priori authorial rulings. In the end, it is about knowing the limit, as was the I think therefore, I exist which Descartes gained from applying doubt to everything in order to avoid making a mistake, is what put an end to that doubt and began the path of the systematic search for certainty. Likewise, Kant's search for the contradictions of pure reason was his way to find the limit and his knowledge of the limit is what it charted the way to the Chartist method and Chartist knowledge or transcendentalism, which is not related to the topics, but rather to the way we know these topics insofar as this method is a priori. And it is also the one that enlightened him with the principle of pure reason, which was expressed by his famous Copernican revolution in reference to Cowper, 1473 to 1543 AD. The well-known author of the solar transformation and its conclusion is that our perception or sensory sight and our concepts or mental representations are not directed according to the objects, but rather these objects are directed according to the faculty of our eyes and perceptions. Hence, the negative knowledge of the contradictions into which the pure mind falls due to its abstract metaphysical excesses, is what led him to the positive knowledge of the limits of the mind and human knowledge that were drawn by his Chartist approach and his critical philosophy, which are sufficient to get rid of those contradictions. In fact, talking about the development of this positive definition of the mind and its details means talking about transcendental aesthetics and analogy, his theory of sensory knowledge and mental knowledge, which together with transcendental dialectics, constitute one inseparable unit. That is, all about criticism in its cognitive aspect. Here, the pen that knows its limits, being satisfied with the purpose it is presented, stops the dialectical logic of the philosophy of criticism, which in its structure and purpose, does not deviate from being aware of the limit. Perhaps the secret behind every authentic philosophical approach, and it may also be the secret of creativity, or at least an aspect of it in philosophical thinking in general, is the transformation that negative or non-objective critical thinking brings about in the crisis of contradiction, so it turns to positive thinking that builds the subject, and it is the reality of his existence, 
This transformation took place in Descartes and Husserl, as we will see shortly, on the basis of the intuition that contradiction was impossible. Neither of them needed to test the possibility of this transformation. They felt something like a naive belief that the contradiction that appeared to them was impossible, and this belief was based on an absolute metaphysical belief in the validity of formal logic and an absolutely no less belief in the validity and certainty of science, natural and mathematical. They were both very convinced that contradiction is a negative value and that its appearance is a sure sign of the legitimacy of the positive given that they set against it, just as honesty is set against lies and falsity. The matter differs slightly with Kant, who needed to proceed on a tedious and indirect path to consolidate his positive point of view or his conditional approach, for which he was not simply given the intuition that we knew from Descartes and which we will know from Husserl, even if the contradiction and attempts to solve it as previously mentioned remain behind his transformation towards the new approach such that it cannot be separated from it unless it is possible to separate the root from the tree's stem, branches, and fruits. This is indicated by his statement in the important introduction that he added to the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, 1787 AD. If we accept that our empirical knowledge is directed according to the objects as they are things in themselves, and we find that the absolute cannot be thought of without contradiction, then we accept on the contrary that our representation of things as they are given to us is not directed according to these things as they are things in themselves, rather, it is more correct that these subjects, as phenomena, are the ones that are oriented according to our method of representation, and we found that the contradiction has occurred, and that the absolute accordingly does not necessarily exist in things in the sense that we know them, or in the sense that they are given to us, but rather it exists in them. Since we do not know it, that is, as they are objects in themselves, then it becomes clear that what we took for granted at the beginning as an attempt is in fact based on a solid foundation.19. Perhaps the reader will agree with me that the last text expresses the motive that moved Kant, as well as other philosophers, to find a method, which is that eliminating contradiction and overcoming its crisis is the decisive thing in the existence of the absolute or the truth that it establishes or that is given to it. It is natural for a philosopher's perception of contradiction to differ from the philosopher who preceded him, depending on their perception of criticism, and for testing the type of contradiction to determine its methodological approach. What is important is that his critical position on contradiction defines and confirms his methodological principles such that the facts that are given themselves become methodological and objective facts to the extent that they are distinguished from contradictions and they are excluded because they are impossible. It is also natural for this approach to narrow the scope of truth and the concept of existence. For Descartes, truth is the truth of the ego, therefore for him, existence was limited to the existence of thought or the thinking ego. According to Kant, it is the existence of necessary, general knowledge of truth. Hence, for him, existence was limited to the a priori definitions and conditions that would enable him to know him. As for Husserl, we will find that it is the truth in itself as pure logic, therefore, his concept of existence was limited to apparent or phenomenological existence, which he gave as a direct and living manifestation of feeling. What remains common among the creators of the method in all these cases is their dissatisfied and resentful approach to the negativity of the contradiction, which makes them search for existence through their attempts to resolve the contradiction. If this is the case, what do we say about a philosopher who removed the critical limit that can't establish to distinguish correct scientific knowledge from metaphysical knowledge that is superficial in the void of contradiction in its absence? Rather, he made contradiction the beating heart of his philosophy, his method, and his entire dialectical vision of thought and existence as a whole. What can we say in brief about Hegel's approach, and in what did he agree with the approaches of his predecessors, and in what did he differ from them? There is no doubt that Hegel's readers, and they are many, thank God, and their presence confirms that silent seriousness has not disappeared from our country, despite the false noise that surrounds us, and almost afflicts us with fatal despair within the circles of culture, literature, art, and philosophy itself, and outside of it as well. I say that Hegel's readers are undoubtedly remembered. His famous phrase mentioned in the introduction to his book The Phenomenology of the Spirit. What I have resolved to do is to participate in my efforts, so that philosophy comes closer to its goal, and is able to put forth the name by which it is described, which is the love of knowledge. To become a real science.20 this effort that Hegel mentions is a systematic effort above all. It differs from all the efforts made by its authors to follow philosophy, on the sure path of science keeping in mind, the progress and accuracy of knowledge in the mathematical and natural sciences. 
The greatest dialectical philosopher of the modern era did not attempt to make his dialectical method a model of reliable knowledge in the conventional sense of the exact sciences, and he did not go so far as to say that the certainty of mathematics is true scientific certainty in more than one place in his writings. He declared his rejection of the mathematical method and not relying on it. Point two one if he established a philosophical method that he described as the only true and scientific method, then he dropped all the conditions of the precise method that others, whether earlier or later, assumed. The reason for this is simple. His completely different position on contradiction is the basis on which he based his approach. For him, the contradiction does not have the double meaning that we find among philosophers searching for the precise method. We have seen how, on the one hand, it represents the actual starting point for the development of their search for the method and it also determines the nature of the idea that will form it and the direction of this development itself. We saw, on the other hand, that they looked at it, i.e., at contradiction as a dead end to knowledge or an illusion whose threads are woven by the mind and a terrible mistake into which it falls of its own volition or by virtue of its inclinations and nature. But Hegel turns his back on all these concepts and challenges that reject contradiction. For him, contradiction is the driving principle of the world and it is one of the principles that most express the truth and essence of things and it is the source of all movement and all life. A thing only moves because it contains at its core contradiction, driving force, and activity. Point two, two contradictions are necessary moments for thinking in its living, evolving system, that is, the system of logic itself. They are conditions upon which knowledge is based, not obstacles in its path, and do not conflict with its concept, as was the case with those philosophers. In his opinion, it is not possible to determine the essence of knowledge while excluding contradiction. In this way, he cut the thread or broke the chain that connected Descartes to Kant, then it gathered around Husserl, and they were all linked by a specific idea about the scientificity of philosophy and its strict and precise method. Guided in this as previously said by the exact sciences on the one hand and on the other hand by the formal logic that he rejected contradiction in existence and thought and considered it a sign of inconsistency and corruption. In this way too, philosophy lost at their hands the most important thing that distinguishes it in Hegel's view, which is that it should be knowledge of the all-encompassing whole, or the science of the whole, for which the dialectical method was only a display of its development in its threefold rhythms or many triangles. The keenness of these philosophers on an accurate approach and knowledge free of contradiction has opened a deep wound or created a deep rift in thinking itself, which has not ceased to appear and be constantly renewed. He divided it into two opposite halves to the extreme limits of opposition. A negative delusional or outwardly false thought that raises itself by itself and a true or positive thought. The strenuous efforts that Kant made to bridge this rift and build a bridge between the two rifts are well known. It ultimately led to the distinction between pure reason and practical reason so that he demonstrated in the first a type of knowledge necessary scientific and general truth, that there is no way to prove in the second mind, which is moral and religious knowledge, and so that he was able to say in the end in what looked like despair or resignation. Thus I had to raise, eliminate or abolish, knowledge in order to make room for faith, or belief. 23 Thus, the internal unity of thinking was destroyed, and a separation was made for Kant in particular between contradictory and unsystematic knowledge, in what he called dogmatic metaphysics i.e. that which restricts judgment in matters of absolute truths without sufficient evidence or support, and accurate scientific or methodological knowledge. Hegel confronted this deep rift, and his entire philosophy attempted to restore the inner unity of thought and existence. His strong criticism of previous approaches is evidence of his acute awareness of the fracture of the modern mind or spirit, and of his belief that his dialectical approach is what will restore metaphysics to its methodological meaning and restore to it the dignity of science. In his criticism of previous approaches, we will cite some texts that bring us closer to the essence of his philosophy, or revolve around its axis. We begin with his criticism of formal logic, which Kant believed in its s-t-a-b-i-l-i-t-y-24 without significant change since the time of Aristotle, his question is whether the image of logic that Kant relied on in his efforts to establish the accurate philosophical method is the final image that represents accurate philosophical knowledge, or whether logic itself is an evolving knowledge in itself. The old logic needs to be completely changed. In fact, the feeling of the need to amend it is very ancient, and in terms of the the form and content in which it appears in academic references, it has been so to speak despised. If people do not stop adhering to it, 
This is only because they feel that logic in general is something indispensable and they are accustomed to believing in its importance based on a long heritage, not out of a conviction that this familiar content and preoccupation with these empty forms have real value or benefit.25 Then he goes on to say about his dialectical approach. And if I do not deny that the approach that I followed in this logical system, or rather that the same system follows needs further completion, and that it is acceptable to introduce partial details into it, then I know at the same time, that it is the approach, the only real one. This becomes clear if we know that it is not something different from its subject and content, because the content itself, that is, the dialectics that it contains in itself, is what drives it to continuous movement. It is clear that no presentation can have the quality of science unless it follows the path of this method and agrees with its simple rhythm. Because it is the course of the subject itself.26 If we go back to Kant, we would find him portraying dialectic in the form of an apparent art that gives all our knowledge a mental form so much so that when we investigate its content, we find it to be hollow and extremely poor. It is confirmed to us that this general logic, i.e. dialectic, which does not deviate from being a law of judgment, it has become like an organ and that is used, or rather misused, to produce claims that deceive us with their objective appearance.27. This image cannot, of course, be compared, from near or far, to Hegel's true and scientific image. However, Hegel acknowledges Kant's credit and approves of his saying that dialectical thinking is an integral part of the formation of the mind, even if he disagreed with him, of course, in his condemnation of his apparent knowledge, or the illusion, can't place the dialectic in a high place, and this is for his merit, he stripped from it the appearance of arbitrariness which ordinary conception had attached to it, and presented it in the form of a necessary act of the mind.28 thus, the necessary appearance was transformed, and the sterile, illusory knowledge was transformed into an objective and systematic moment of thinking. In fact, this moment that expresses the subjective movement of thinking becomes, in his view, the methodological and objective core of philosophy itself. There are many Hegelian texts that confirm that philosophy is not only the movement of perceived thought, but rather it is above all the movement of thought that realizes itself, and with it philosophy begins its true beginning. Philosophy begins where the general is perceived as comprehensive existence, or where existence is viewed in a general way in which thinking appears in thinking.29 in its first stage among the Greeks and the Eletics in particular, it moved from the abstract idea to the idea that defines itself.30 at the end of the philosophical era, which Hegel feels is his era that represents the completion of its previous history. Philosophy reached the stage of the living, comprehensive idea that knows itself.31 or the idea that thinks of itself, and the truth that knows itself, as stated at the end of his book, The Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences.32. We will not be able here to address the reflection of knowledge or thinking on itself, because this means that we discuss his entire philosophy and how its content developed, or revealed itself, as he put it. In this context, it is sufficient to examine the systematic nature of this idea and how this objective relationship of thinking was transformed into a method. There is no doubt that the idea of the triple rhythm of the Hegelian dialectic, from a direct topic to the opposite of an intermediate topic to a compound that combines them and raises them together, and maintains them at a higher and more fertile level, has jumped into the reader's mind, after it became the common property of the cultured consciousness in the whole world, may have tended to think that the idea of this tripartite rhythm is the same as the idea of the dialectical method and its path. However, the form of the dialectical path is not the secret of its life and vitality, and if we focus the effort on it, we would turn the mill of the famous dialectical triangles, just as the mills of frightening ghosts ran before in the good dreaming night, Don Quixote, and we would harm ourselves in Hegel, and perhaps we would have unwittingly participated in provoking it, the winds of accusation and ridicule that always blew against him. This is because reading Hegel through the lens of the famous triangle may bring us into his world and may help us read the living existence outside and the living thought within. But it will not put our hands on the comprehensive living idea from which the method began to which it returns in the end after the epic struggle and hardship. Dot. The beginning of this idea is her thinking about her thinking, and the beginning of the method is that thinking about thinking results in his raising, denying or robbing himself, and expanding his knowledge of himself. In clearer terms, the opposite of the subject is the elevation of the subject, and the compound is the new unity that forms between them, all of which are necessary moments in the self-application of the comprehensive living idea, that is, of the idea of the idea, or the thinking of things. Thinking. 
or the awareness of consciousness, mind or spirit, of itself.33 Perhaps it has now become clear to us that Hegel places on his idea the entire philosophical experience, perhaps with a few material and realistic exceptions, and this experience says that the mind itself is the one that generates its contradictions with itself and its justifications or foundations for itself. Thus, we find ourselves faced with the dual use of what we call thinking about thinking, or self-reflection, or the reflection of thought consciousness, and mind in the mirror of itself. The idea carries its negation within it, in accordance with what Hegel said in his book The Science of Logic. What the idea itself grows and develops through is the negation, or negation, given before that, and it is what it folds into itself, and this is what constitutes the true dialectic.34 that is the first methodological moment. As for the second moment, he says it in the book mentioned above, realizing the opposition in its unity, or recognizing the positive in the negative.35 the second moment, is what prevents us from understanding the negation or self-negation of the idea, as if it were its destruction or elimination. In fact, it confirms its existence again in a richer and broader form, as previously mentioned, and it also transfers self-negation to self-affirmation on a higher level. In this sense also, the three rhythmic step of the dialectical method can be summarized in one step or movement, which is the self-movement of the comprehensive idea. It is as if the self-relationship, which appears once in the form of negativity and appears again in the form of positivity, is what constitutes the unity of the various conditions that proceed in the movement of its growth, from the subject to the opposite of the subject to the combination of both. Through this self-relationship, the first two stages retreat to connect with the overall idea from which it began. Since truth is the whole as Hegel's famous phrase says, then contradiction must occupy its systematic place in this whole, and it must be the place of the heart in the living organic body. Our goal for this show was not the disruptor. Hegel's dialectical method is to look at its live applications on his rich and diverse works, and this was not the goal of presenting the methods of the two previous philosophers, or the method of the philosopher we will discuss now. He is Husserl, the author of the philosophy of phenomena or phenomenology. Our humble effort has been limited to verifying the purpose with which we began, which is that thinking or self-reflection that confronts contradiction in its crises and attempts to solve them and show that they are impossible is what represents the starting point for the new approach and it also expresses creativity or an aspect of it at the very least in their philosophy. Before we conclude our talk about Hegel and his dialectical approach, we must say a word about what he has in common with the three philosophers and what distinguishes him from them. Self-reflection or the thought of thought is the center of his philosophy, which is nothing more than a major attempt at self-awareness. He, like them, establishes a precise scientific method, which he called as we have seen the only true method even if he did not take as his model the exact sciences and mathematics in particular. Rather, it refused to be the basis or ideal. However, he did not keep up with them in separating between the positive knowledge, which they agreed was the correct knowledge, and the negative knowledge, which they made every effort to exclude and remove its contradictions, or rather to prove that it removes itself by itself. He also did not take into account the criterion they set for the accurate method, which is that contradiction is a characteristic of faulty knowledge and a sign of deceptive or false thinking. This means that he clearly knew that the theoretical construction of the rational world is impossible without acknowledging the contradiction. Contradiction, as previously said, is not merely an initial impulse from which the movement of the method and the movement of the mind or spirit begin together. Rather, it occupies its methodological place from the true whole, or, if you like, from the total truth that itself grows dialectically at the rhythm of the dialectical method. There is no doubt that this expresses what is called unity of method and doctrine, and in a way that we may not find with such strength and coherence in any ancient or modern philosopher. Finally, we move by virtue of historical development alone to a philosopher who differed from Hegel, and who perhaps in the opinion of some, did not benefit significantly from his methodological and dialectical revolution, even though he competed with him in a major and final attempt to make philosophy a comprehensive, comprehensive science. I say this to remind the reader that the philosopher we will talk about Husserl, is related to the two previous philosophers, Descartes and Kant, and is considered an extension, or rather a culmination, of transcendent subjectivity, more than he is related to Hegel or other dialecticians. How did the new approach of the author of the phenomenological philosophy appear? How did the blatant negation of contradiction and the tendency of some logicians to interpret the facts of logic and mathematics psychologically lead him to the positive, which is to secure the truth of the subject or even to secure the truth itself? 
and protect it from doubt and psychological and human relativity? We are not concerned here with detailing the nature of the phenomenological method, its characteristics, stages, and the extent of its fertility in application, as much as we are concerned with highlighting the common feature between it and the rest of the methods that we are presenting, which is the emergence of the new and positive from the rubble of the negative and contradictory. It is enough for us to look at the first part of logical research to confirm this keenness to secure the truth of thought, then we also see towards the end of this part how the negative critical approach to the contradictions of psychological tendencies is transformed into a positive approach to prove the truth of the subject or the truth of objective thinking. It is not possible the existence of something without being determined in this or that way. The fact that it exists and is defined in this or that way means that this is the truth in itself, the truth which constitutes the necessary addition of existence in itself. 36 Husserl goes on to explain the meaning of the objectivity of the subject, saying, when we achieve an act of knowledge, or as I like to express it when we live in it, we are preoccupied with the objective aspect that that act intends and naturally places it in an epistemological manner, and the more precisely our knowledge is meanings of the word, that is, whenever we make a judgment based on intuition, we have given the objective an original giveaway. In this case, it does not seem to us that we are facing the objective fact, but rather this fact is actually represented before our eyes, as is the subject itself, in terms of what it is and what it is, that is precisely as intended in this knowledge and not in any other way, that is, as a bearer of these characteristics, a link in these relationships, and the like. Likewise, he does not appear to us with these characteristics, but rather the action is based on them, and in this way he gives us knowledge. That is the only meaning of this is that it is not limited to it appearing to us as such, or the matter does not stop when we judge it as such, but rather it has been known as it is, or its being as such has become an actual reality, unique in the living experience of intuitive judgment. So if as long as we contemplate this uniqueness and achieve intellectual abstraction 37 truth itself, instead of that objective aspect becomes the perceived object, then we recognize truth as the ideal coexistence of this objective, transitory act of knowledge and as the single truth in comparison with the infinite variety of possible acts of knowledge of knowing individuals.38. The previous text, despite its difficulty, is not limited to expressing what Husserl means by objectivity, but rather goes beyond describing the path he followed and summarizing the method he followed. When we make a judgment based on intuition, that is, when we have accurate knowledge, it is because the subject of knowledge has been given to us directly and authentically. In fact, Husserl established his evidence of the corruption of the psychological tendency in understanding logic on the basis of intuition, and proved that this tendency necessarily leads to contradiction. For the sake of this proof, and those proofs that secure the truth of knowledge, the truth in question must appear in an objective form. What is meant is the truth that becomes an object, that is, a truth in itself, hence, the negative criticism of doubt and relativism, that the psychological tendency in logic leads to, has resulted in a positive topic, and the truth of this topic, and indeed the truth in itself, has emerged in this dialectical form out of negativity or contradiction. It is as if his thinking and developing his philosophical approach, which he would rely on to reveal the truth of the subject or the objectivity of the truth, was linked to critical and negative thinking about a certain paradox or antithesis. This connection was not a coincidence, it was repeated as we saw before with the skeptical approach according to Descartes, and with the Chartist, transcendental, method, according to Kant. Because the positivity of the approach is based on a negative background, and the formation of this negative background is necessarily linked to the formation of the subject and the truth. If Husserl had here cut off his reflections on the method and began collecting the results he had reached in the concept of the given and ideal meaning, then in the second part of the logical investigations he set about continuing his analyses of the subject, this subject must be given an original, initial gift. And the fact that it is given is its mode of existence that links the subject to the subject. It also implies at the same time its existence and the necessity of this existence in comparison with a person. That is, it is necessary for it to appear to a certain consciousness feeling or self, otherwise it ceases to be a given. From here, the method began its steps and expanded it, and the task of the phenomenological became to investigate topics from the point of view of their being given to a feeling or awareness, which he directs to and intends by his intentional action actions, and seeing essences and analyses of meaning became his tools in this research. In this way, Husserl has defined and clarified the field of phenomena. It is the field in which subjects are investigated and both subject and subject have equal rights, 
the subject appears and the subject sees and describes what it sees, and truth exists wherever the subject appears as it is, and wherever it is seen, or rather its essence is seen, in a way that appears to the feeling and has a pure, direct appearance, thus, phenomena move toward objects and remain with them, it does not hover over it in abstract contemplation, nor does it concern itself with its material entity, upon which it suspends judgment or places it in parentheses. Rather, it lives it, experiences it, and sees its essence with an intuitive, living vision. Space is limited to trace the steps of the phenomenological approach, its stages of response, transforming subjects into ideal subjects and ensuring their existence as fixed essences in feeling or transcendent consciousness, as he detailed and elaborated in his book Ideas. It is enough for us that the method itself emerged from a crisis of decline to lead to positive processes that have no end, to create the objectivity of subjects and to secure their immutable truths in the kingdom of transcendent feeling which in a sense is the kingdom of absolute existence.39 it is also sufficient for us to point out that, with this approach, he wanted to raise philosophy to the level of accurate scientific knowledge. As for his success or failure in achieving this ancient hope, that is another matter. This is because the phenomenological approach that began by separating the method from the subject matter as is the case in the exact sciences, ended up making the method itself a subject of research. Thus, he opened a vast horizon for philosophical knowledge and psychological questions that could not be encompassed by a specific method or a specific topic. Husserl began to break into the kingdom of feeling or transcendent consciousness, which in a sense is the kingdom of absolute existence in the transcendent ideal stage, which began with the publication of his book Ideas on Pure Phenomenology and Phenomenal Philosophy, between the years 1913 AD and 1928 AD. He turned to a new type of subjective transcendent idealism, which not only established the necessary symbiosis between intentional objectivity and the lived experience of intention, but rather attributed it to feeling, or the pure transcendent self in its systematic pursuit of seeing essences, the processes of formation or construction, that give meaning to the world and existence. Late in his life, he returned to entering the field of pure transcendent subjectivity in a definitive and decisive way. In his Cartesian Meditations, 1931 AD, he confirmed the possibility of arriving at the pure transcendent ego, which is the final basis for all thinking. To his critics, it seemed as if this ego or self had remained hostage to its subjective and highly individual confinement, and did not address the historical and social conditions that determine it. It is true that the world of life which for him is another expression of what we usually call social and historical phenomena, remain one of the most important tasks of the ego or transcendent subjectivity, and he proved that its relationship with the other and other subjects, and what he called shared subjectivity enters into the core of its formation and is indispensable for establishing scientific objectivity. However, readers and critics missed his specific positions on specific problems about society and history, and some of them almost accused him of neglecting aspects of human work and practice in the world.40 even, if his manuscripts continued to be published in the famous series Husserl's Writings or the Husserlians, since the year 1950 AD people became aware of one of his most important books, which is The Crisis of European Science and Transcendental Phenomena in which he was not limited to dealing with concepts from the world of life, such as society, ethics, and history. But rather above all, he was exposed to the crisis of European science and the plight of European existence conscience and humanity, all of which, unfortunately, are one thing for him, as if science, existence, and humanity are European or not. It was not a coincidence that the word crisis, crisis, appeared in the title of this book.41 since it was natural for him to deepen his feeling for it after the hardship of walking a long road, he imagined, at the end of it, which was coupled with old age and the concerns of the inevitable end that he had completed his duty, completed the foundation of his philosophy, and was confident in establishing comprehensive science, or mathesis universalis, which remained the main concern of a number of people. Many Western philosophers, starting with Plato, in his theory of forms to Descartes, Leibniz, and Kant to the constructivists and Rudolf Carnap 1891-1970 AD, and his fellow empiricists or positivists logical in their project of unified science. It is known that the approach of the natural and mathematical sciences remained the ideal for a large number of philosophers, at least from the Renaissance until the late 19th century. For them, following this approach was a condition of certainty, accuracy, and objectivity to the point that they applied it to problems that were neither mathematical nor natural in nature, from metaphysics, ethics, psychological and social phenomena, even proofs of the existence of God. Despite the progress that has been achieved in some human sciences, such as sociology, 
sociology, economics, and psychology in particular, by following this precise scientific method the problem of method in the human sciences emerged in the early 20th century, and controversy arose around it, the flames of which have not yet subsided, as it became clear to some, such as Bergson, Dilthey, and Husserl himself, and most of his students and beneficiaries of his theoretical approach, those who adhere to the philosophy of existence, the philosophy of interpretation, hermeneutics, and dialectical social critics, that the human phenomenon is of a different type from the natural phenomenon and that it cannot be measured, predicted, and ultimately controlled by laboratory means, sports analytics and statistics, because in their opinion, the human being is not an object and is not a quantity but rather a self, freedom, quality, living experience, and a unique life world. The crisis of European science, natural and mathematical, was exacerbated by its failure temporary, to say the least. In applying his methods to phenomena in the human sciences, the crisis of these sciences became, in essence, and in Husserl's view, the crisis of the European feeling itself regarding the complex of living experience and its loss of its opinion, the source and material of science. On the verge of this double crisis, both materially and formally, and because of it, phenomenology began to search for a special approach to the human sciences that preserves the quality of the phenomenon and distinguishes it from the natural phenomenon and the mathematical phenomenon. Then he makes a third path, which Husserl called phenomenology.42 thus. The phenomena developed with the development of their treatment in one way or another of this crisis, through its various stages, and in Husserl's production that he published during his lifetime, until its sharp critical problem crystallized in the book The Crisis, which we will now pause for a brief moment. Husserl tried to confront the crisis of the human sciences and to break out of the captivity of the natural and mathematical models that had led it, as previously mentioned, to fall into that crisis by establishing his philosophy, which he gave to it many names, from a comprehensive science to a science of essences and beginnings to a first philosophy to a comprehensive theory of knowledge and existence to the archaeology of feeling etc. Perhaps the closest of these names to our purpose is that this philosophy is a theory of transcendent, transcendental, subjectivity and shared subjectivity, or in short, it is the science of feeling. In the book we are considering, he dealt with the common experience of European civilization, or in other words, the European civilizational or collective feeling, both its rational and experimental parts, from its beginnings among the Greeks and Romans to its purely rational peak with Descartes, until its completion in the philosophy of phenomena or phenomenology itself. Thus, he added to his perception of this philosophy as a pure science or theory, another perception of it as a philosophy of history, or even his ultimate goal and purpose. The reference to these two dimensions in his lectures was preceded by Cartesian meditations, which he dedicated to the memory of Descartes, with whom European feeling actually began. Husserl did not care to talk about the known origins and sources of what he called European feeling, with the exception of the Greek source, to which he paid most attention. For a simple reason, which is that European civilization is considered an original creation in an unusual way, and that it, unlike other ancient civilizations in the far and near east, which remained mythological, moral and practical, has taken upon itself the burden of searching for theoretical truth and realizing humanity's first scientific project that has long been desired. Its philosophy as previously said, is to establish a comprehensive science that is both synonymous with truth and identical to reality.43. Regardless of the Eurocentrism in this position, which began at least with Aristotle and reached its ugly peak with Hegel, especially in his presentation of the philosophy of history in the ancient East, he repeats the opinion of a large number of Western historians of philosophy, which is that the Greek civilization and their philosophy in particular, it was interested more than any other civilization in pure theory or the idea and it had taken. According to its mental level and civilizational progress, the first serious steps on the path to phenomena or comprehensive science in the sense that I understood it, which was represented by the Pythagorean theory, and the philosophy of life according to Socrates, who is considered the imam of subjectivity. European, the theory of forms or ideals according to Plato, the philosophy of nature and the system of formal logic according to Aristotle, and finally in Euclid's geometry. However, Greek civilization, or rather Greek philosophy, 
which had reached a high level of rationality, was unable to achieve its project of establishing the theory of comprehensive science. As rational theorizing collapsed towards the materialistic doctrines, the doctrines of skepticism, and the ethical issues of the Epicureans and the Stoics, for whom the last glimmer of ideal objectivity shone in their idea of the cosmic logos. Where, then, is the starting point of pure European feeling as Husserl understood and interpreted it? It begins with the famous Cartesian Cogito, this is why Descartes was the true discoverer of the world of subjectivity, and the first founder of phenomenology. Husserl confirmed this in his previously mentioned Cartesian meditations, even though he blamed the father of modern philosophy for the fact that his subjectivity was marred by psychological and experimental elements and that his ego knew the thinking ego and did not know the subject of thinking nor did it know the other as a party opposite to it. Therefore, he, i.e., Husserl, explored its depths and freed it from psychological and sensory impurities. Thus, he completed it by arriving at the pure transcendent self or ego, from which it is possible to imagine the annihilation of everything in the world and its disappearance except for itself. And he achieved the project of European civilization, which is the establishment of phenomena, phenomenology, that is, the final image of transcendental philosophy and German idealism, and indeed of the entire history of Western philosophy. Husserl analyzes empiricism in its many forms, natural, sensory, materialistic, positivistic, etc., and shows that it was a reaction to the rational tendency, forgetting the world, and eliminating things. Then it turned to the opposite, so the world and it became a material world, and living experience became mere sensory impressions, and the soul became what Locke says is a blank slate, on which the sensations can engrave what they wish, or, as Hume put it, a mere bundle of impressions, thus the internal experience was mixed with the external experience. The common experience between subjects was eliminated, and rational objectivity became impossible. Kant's critical attempt came to reconcile the sensory and the rational, or in his words between intuitions or objects, and perceptions or concepts, and with it came the incomplete solution to the problem of dualism, in the Aristotelian manner of form and matter or form and content. Then, he soon sacrificed them both together that is, the image of the rational and matter. Empiricists when knowledge was abandoned in favor of morality and religion, and feeling remained a mere cobweb whose function was to catch matter from the outside world, without discovering living feeling and living experience. Point four four in the end, Kant's critical idealism was unable to achieve anything of the European feeling project, which is the establishment of a comprehensive science that took a new name, phenomenology. It is what avoided the shortcomings in Kant's philosophy, expanded the scope of his transcendental sensitivity, which includes his theory of space-time and sensory perception, and made it expand to all aspects of the field of life. It also restored effectiveness to his transcendent logic and transformed sensory intuition into intellectual or theoretical intuition or a concrete vision of essences. Dot. If absolute idealism, in its various forms according to Fitch, Hegel, and Schelling, has achieved tangible progress in the European project to complete comprehensive science, it was able to eliminate the ancient dualism and restore the inner unity between reason and experience, spirit and nature thought and existence. To the point that the word phenomenology was used by Hegel in his famous book on the phenomenology of the spirit, in which he described the construction of European feeling and its development. If all of this is true, then it, i.e., absolute idealism, could not transform philosophy into a precise, precise science, and it remained ambiguous, mixed with romantic poetics, and it remained linked to religion. Where did the European Civilization Project or its historical dream of establishing comprehensive science end? The answer is simple, he came to the phenomenology of Husserl himself, and to the phenomenological cogito, which combined in his intentional feeling the mind and experience, the subject and the object, the ego and the other. Thus, the hope that the European mind had always sought and tried to express in different images was achieved. Thus, at the end of his life, Husserl assumed the role of a prophet and preacher, who began to alert European civilization to the danger facing it. The crisis of European science is, in the end, the crisis of European man himself, and there is no way to escape except by rebuilding his feeling which lost the world of life and lost truth, when it surrendered to formal mental tendencies on the one hand, and drowned in experimental and materialistic currents on the other hand. 
however, this living, transcendent feeling, on which Husserl based both science and experience, remains a puzzling matter. Do we describe his call to explore it as a new ideal call to a new humanity, or as a Sufi and luminous tendency of a strange kind, which led its owner to take refuge in the depths of feeling cognitive and logical, and hide in his labyrinth to avoid the pressures of the historical world surrounding him, and to escape the political and social revolutions of the era? If Husserl succeeded in changing the subconscious feeling of many of his followers and readers, was his philosophy able to become a tool to influence reality? And I do not say to change or enlighten it. The criterion of truth by which philosophy is measured cannot be limited to the coherence of its ideas and the consistency of its internal logic. How many consistent philosophies have come from which no significant action has emerged and which have remained despite their majesty and depth, more like the ruins of an ancient temple or a ruined, abandoned palace? I do not actually mean the amount of apparent material or practical influence in terms of power, spread, and influence, if this were the case, we would count the philosophies adopted or adopted by totalitarian regimes with brute force and influence as the truest philosophies and closest to the truth, while the painful historical experience testifies that they are the farthest from it, and the most extreme in incoherence, misguidance, and invalidity. Although the problem requires more detail than the space here, the sincerity and vitality of philosophy does not lie in my humble estimation in confronting a current crisis or crises and proposing a way out of it or a solution to it, and there is never a final solution in philosophy or science. As much as it lies in in creating new crises that challenge thought to test its weapons, perhaps the strength, honesty, and creativity also lie in the philosophy of phenomenology, because the methodological crisis it provoked brought to life other crises among a large group of students of its founder. Whether those who followed him on the path or those who rejected his self-transcendent idealism in its late stage, and the sign of this is the multiplicity of fertile applications. The phenomenological approach and its diversity in addition to the multiplicity of beneficiaries of this approach and the diversity of their trends and fields of research and interest, such as Oscar Becker in the philosophy of sports, Alexander Fender in logic and psychology, Max Scheller in Hatz Rayer in ethics, Roman Engarden in art and beauty and Nikolai Hartmann in knowledge and the theory of existence, and its classes, Heidegger and Sartre in the philosophy of existence and phenomenological ontology, Merleau-Ponty in perception and language, Eugen Fink in the universality of the world, Gadamer, Risker and Bolnet in the philosophy of interpretation or hermeneutics, Adorno and Marcuse, members of the Frankfurt School in their critical theory of social reality and industrial and capitalist society etc. If it is true that all of this confirms the creative aspect of phenomena and that it is a method above all else, then there is no doubt that as a philosophy of the interior, it is confirmed on the other hand the inability of all idealistic, subjective philosophy philosophies directed towards the interior to influence the movement of historical and social reality. This is not only due to the absence of dialectical thinking from Husserl, or rather to his rejection of it, but it is also due to his self-idealism revealing the crisis of alienation from which idealist philosophies suffer, and which they themselves are considered an extension of, despite their keenness to distinguish themselves from them in various forms and reasons. Dot. Anyone who imagines that the task of philosophy or at least one of its basic tasks is to criticize the prevailing reality based on a comprehensive vision that works to change and transform it must assume that phenomenology has transferred the real action in its view to the inner feeling and that it has neglected social action or almost except for some vague, scarce references to the world of life shared subjectivity and work in the world as previously said, or to a phenomenological meeting that barely emerged from the walls of the academic towers into the turbulent reality, which was the social and political revolutions. In the 20s and 30s of the century, it was shaken and its foundations were shaken, just as during the lifetime of Husserl himself, the hordes of barbarism, Nazis, encroached upon it fulfilling the frightening prophecy that he announced at the end of his book about the crisis of European science, about the fall of Europe into its alienation from the rational meaning of its life, and its decline into the abyss, brutality and hostility to the spirit. It is no wonder, after all this, that the adherents of traditional Marxism direct the arrows of their criticism at phenomena and place them in the ranks of the bourgeois philosophies that have been alienated from historical social reality, and have neglected the realistic and dialectical material conditions that determine feeling from the point of view of their philosophy, which is ultimately a theory. Indeed, in their opinion, phenomena express much more than other late bourgeois philosophies, 
the crises of bourgeois capitalist society and the corruption of its vision, imperialist liberalism of the world and reality. It tried to be a way out of what he called the crisis of life and the crisis of reason and science, but its efforts and attempts to bring philosophy to the level of a rigorous and accurate science were doomed to failure in light of the capitalist colonial climate and its authoritarian and inhumane practice on the outside and inside and on nature and all of humanity and our Arab world is witnessing today. The renewal of its dominance in images that are uglier and more horrific than anything known in global history. Perhaps the most important thing about Marxist criticism of phenomenology is that it suffered from the stark contradiction between the Enlightenment tendency that nourished it in light of the liberal climate of bourgeois Western society and the totalitarian and irrational tendency represented by ideal, transcendent or extremist subjectivity which it reached in its late stage. In fact, this is a testimony of truth and fairness, despite the condemnation and unfairness that may appear on its face. It confirms in its own way what we tried to confirm, that the philosophy of phenomenology did not only suffer from contradiction, but that the crisis of contradiction was its driving force. And perhaps it was also behind the original creativity that only the ignorant or the ungrateful would deny. Thus it becomes clear to us that contradiction is an interacting unit of struggle between two interconnected opposites, one of which conditions and excludes the other at the same time. We must bring to mind the ideas of unity and conflict, or the two basic characteristics of all forms of contradiction, and its multiple formations, which the past of philosophical thought has not been devoid of, and its future will not be devoid of, to the extent that the nature of opposites differs, whether logical and cognitive or objective and realistic, and the type of dialectical relationship in a realistic and historical unity, or in a purely intellectual interconnection, the nature of the dialectical contradiction inherent in evolving living things processes, and systems also differs from the nature of the logical contradiction that takes place in the field of pure thought. If we have limited our efforts in this regard to the logic of contradiction in which thought reflects upon its Itself in a kind of self-reflection in its mirror. And we have tried to limit our discussion to the crisis that led previous philosophers to emerge from it by creating a method which also became a new starting point. This does not preclude saying that there are other forms of the basic contradictions that we have known, and their Hegelian form in particular, which are forms or formations in which the philosopher's thinking sometimes reflected on his emotional and inner conflicts and contradictions, which he endured in order to reach the religious absolute as in Kierkegaard, or he turned his awareness at other times to the reality of material conflicts and contradictions, which he explained in a scientific way as the development of nature, work and human society in his past and present, and he also defined with it the method of practice and revolutionary change on the path to his future, as is the case with Marcus and the proponents of dialectical materialism, or, for a third time, he focused his thinking on other conflicts that resulted in dialectical formations that are difficult to enumerate and fulfill.45. What is important in this context is that the logical contradiction, which every true thought and accurate science must exclude and eliminate, does not deny the existence of the contradiction or dialectical contradictions in reality and prevailing knowledge. This is because the first contradiction does not say anything about the forms of the second contradiction, except in an implicit, metaphysical or ontological way, and through an understanding and analysis that can only be carried out by those with psychological and human practical tendencies of pure logic, but it is nevertheless an indispensable condition for the latter, so that it can be said that we cannot properly understand historical dialectical contradictions without acknowledging the principle of logical contradiction and not falsifying it or deviating from it, so that all correct thought and science can be upright, as previously said, and it is possible to represent the dialectical contradictions of nature and social reality objectively free of contradiction and to seek systematic solutions to them that are also free of contradiction. Perhaps we can now strive to extract some of the general features that characterize the curriculum, regardless of its types, applications, and goals. A. There is no single approach, but multiple approaches. Philosophical approaches always coexist even if they do not coexist peacefully. No matter how much one claims that it is the only scientific method, B. There is no complete, complete and final approach. In fact, it is a project that experiments with its capabilities at the hands of its founder or his students and followers, and continuously attempts it in its various fields of application. Thus, it grows and increases in richness and confirmation of its theoretical foundations and principles, modifying them, or refining some of them during its living movement, as happened, but not limited to with the Chartist or Transcendental method after Kant, from the rest of the German idealists to the Neo-Kantians and with the Hegelian idealist method with 
Many idealists and with the dialectical materialist approach with the proponents of neo-Marxism in recent decades and the phenomenological approach with many of Husserl's direct and indirect followers and the structuralist approach that broke out into different and sometimes conflicting structures etc. See the curriculum begins and remains in a never-ending state. He constantly criticizes himself and puts himself in constant question. Without this constant criticism and questioning, he would not have been able to be renewed and transformed. Even if its founder was fanatical about its principles and denounced any deviation from its rules, successors soon took from it something that might not exceed its general spirit and abandon things, and the previous examples make this clear. Doctor the method is not just a creative intuition, even if its owner is guided to its starting point in a sudden moment of revelation, as happened with Descartes. It is the result of patient effort, which may take an entire lifetime, or the lifetime of generations that keep renewing and supporting it through theory and practice, and testing the extent of its productivity, effectiveness, and response or non-response, to changing cognitive and practical circumstances. It is no wonder, then, that some of the approaches that proved their validity in their time and in their own doctrinal system, became merely a historical scholarly relic, as happened to the Aristotelian teleological approach from the Renaissance to today, after precise scientific approaches abandoned the search for the goal, and replaced it with the how of the how, why? Even though there were only a few philosophers who tried to revive it in modern and contemporary philosophy, from Leibniz and Kant to the vital philosopher Hans Driesch. However, the relativity of philosophical approaches and their specificity to their spatial, temporal, cultural, and civilizational circumstances does not prevent the statement that the methodology itself is binding on everyone who philosophizes at all times and circumstances. E-method may mix with doctrine, such that it becomes impossible to separate them, as we find with Hegel and Bergson. The philosopher's philosophy may be the method for which it is difficult to define a doctrine, vision or ideology, as is the case with Husserl, for example. The features and steps of the curriculum may be determined before or after its implementation. It may not crystallize in a specific way, or the author of the method himself does not care to crystallize it, so others try to do so, as we see with the analytical method pioneered by George Moore. Without this diminishing its originality and creativity when applied to several metaphysical and ideal problems, to prove through linguistic and logical analysis of its expressions that it is not problems at all. Because the subject and philosophy is comprehensive comprehensive and unlimited, no method can comprehend it from all its aspects, and every method that attempted or claimed this has violated that subject and lost the original spirit of the method itself. The subject of philosophy if it is correct to call it by this name, does not determine the method and is determined by it, as is the case in the partial sciences. Rather, it occurs before and after the method and is never allowed to be captured within the network of a single method. Hence, the approaches and philosophy multiply and are renewed, or they are copied and terminated like any project that is proven incapable of explaining total reality, with the change of circumstances, tools, goals, formulations of the philosophical question, and attempts by the productive and changing aspects to build knowledge, awareness, and existence. And the finally, it is not possible to separate the method from civilization, whether in its fall and decline, or in its resurrection and renaissance, and perhaps the major cultural turning points are turning points in the methods of methodological consideration. The most famous and recurring examples of this are are the decline of the Greek rational theory approach in the Hellenistic era, and the emergence of the Renaissance era with the emergence of the method scientific, natural, and precise mathematics, and supported by its great scientists. Therefore, we do not need to explain the importance of the method and its role in science and life. Our entire conversation was limited to the creative aspect, which is its starting point. Although the narrow scope will not allow for exposure to the historical and cultural circumstances favorable or unfavorable in which it begins, the historical and cultural moment in which we live today obliges us to pay attention to our Arab reality, which is almost crying out for the lamp of the approach that will dispel its darkness and overcome its stumbling blocks and calamities. The discussion focuses on the beginning of the method without the details of its construction, application, and results. At the end of this article, we will limit ourselves at the end of this article to this beginning, the conditions for achieving it, and the obstacles that prevent this verification, to the creative scientific image that the philosopher seeks, or to the effective, changing image that the citizen expects and relies on in responding to his vital demands, and answering the crucial questions that are mysteriously looming in his chest, 
and which disturb the philosopher, or should disturb him in an acute mental manner. It is natural for us to content ourselves with asking a set of questions and giving some indications. Because the issue is too big for us to confront it with some ready-made answers and the problem is too dangerous for us to resolve it with some methods that its owners believe are absolutely certain. The reality, which in recent months has reached the peak of its crisis and contradiction and is still vulnerable to further crisis and contradiction, cannot suddenly result from creativity or a miraculous creator and the matter must fall on the shoulders of all those who are alert to the depth and extent of the crisis and who pity the fate of a civilization threatened by extinction and moral annihilation and materialism and it is inevitable that there should be a general and comprehensive dialogue around it and that it should be a free critical dialogue in which every participant believes that criticism must criticize itself and that there is no criticism that is superior to criticism. It is natural that systematic anxiety is the highest form of anxiety that our anxious souls experience and there is no doubt that this anxiety is not the product of the present moment. Its age is close to the age of the modern Arab Renaissance and the question about it and the need for it have been raging for nearly two centuries, at the very least. We can say without going beyond or falling into exaggeration that the problem of the curriculum has been brewing in the conscience of our nation since the era of codification until the so-called eras of decadence. However, for contemporaries, it has turned into a controlling concern. Some said that we suffer from the absence of the method and the methodological vacuum.46 while others saw that the cause of the disaster was methodological chaos and the raging conflict between the multiple approaches emanating from our culture or borrowed from the culture of others and a third group called for an independent national approach, represented by a renaissance project that has been much talked about in recent years. Since philosophy as Hegel taught us is the daughter of its era and time and the philosopher is the one who crystallizes in his philosophical system. System, the culture of his era and time, and places before him the intellectual woman who reflects and condenses the features of his true reality, and criticizes it at the same time, the Arab philosopher who in most cases took the form of an enlightened religious, social and intellectual reformer has not failed since the beginning of the renaissance in performing his methodological role. The result in brief is that the number of curricula has increased, regardless of whether they deserve this name or not, and their range between the two poles of the old and the new, the transmitted and the reasonable, heritage and modernity, conservatism and revolutionaryism, adherence and creativity to the last of these false dualities that have not been established. There was no one who tried to reconcile them in the well-known formula of authenticity and modernity. It was also natural for there to be a lot of writing and writing about method and methodology for university studies to appear on research methods in the various sciences and for seminars and conferences to be held to discuss the problem of method. And to talk about method became about every pen and tongue as if everyone was performing rituals of atonement for their sins against him. There have also been many attempts to adopt contemporary Western philosophical approaches root them and plant them in Arab soil, and attempts to apply and experiment with them in studying our ancient heritage or in analyzing some of our issues, positions and problems in light of them and with their methodological tools. It was as if all Western philosophies and methodologies have been tried and are still being tried. From positivism, idealism, existentialism, personalism, and dialectical materialism, to analytical, critical rationalism, phenomenology, interpretive, phenomenological and hermeneutical, and structuralism in its various directions, even deconstructionism. There is no doubt that all of these are good efforts that deserve appreciation and gratitude and await a comprehensive critical review that will show what they have and what they are, and reveal the extent of their success or concealment, their production or futility, their ability to influence awareness and change reality and enlighten it, or their failure on the level of vision or the level of work or both. If all these commendable efforts inspire satisfaction and admiration, at the same time they multiply anxiety, confusion, and confusion. This is because if it is permissible to say that systematic anxiety is a sign of health and well-being on the cognitive and civilizational levels, then it is also true that it brings us back to a larger problem, which is the problem of our civilizational crisis and its fundamental contradiction. What is the reality of this crisis? What is the nature of this contradiction? 47. The Arab writer who talks about crisis and contradiction cannot ignore the recent crisis that shook his existence and the existence of millions of his nation's people. Because the word crisis has become an overused cliché, it deserves to be called the ordeal of adversity, 
and the catastrophe of disasters, here the magazine deleted an entire page about the final ordeal.48. If we now look at the basic contradiction behind what happened, we will find that opinions necessarily differ about its nature and formula, and I found myself taking the risk of imagining it and putting it in this way. It is self-destruction conflicting with awareness of the necessity of progress. The reader will immediately wonder, isn't this the contradiction of duality in speech and behavior known to the Arabs since ancient times, and has nothing to do with the mental contradiction whose forms and causes I explained before? Is it not an image of the schizophrenia that I referred to a moment ago, and cannot it be an expression of the ongoing conflict between the old and the new, the reactionary and the revolutionary, the bright and prosperous past and a present that is not our present, but rather the present of the European West, which imposes itself as a subject for the entire era and for all of humanity 49 or do you see it as another expression of the natural conflict between the forces of construction and life and the forces of destruction and death or of the famous opposition in IBN Calden's concept between the strength of fanaticism and the softness of civilization? Is this contradiction suitable to explain the misery of Arab consciousness its alienation and the attempts to obscure and falsify it throughout its history? And at its current moment. Finally, what could it mean for philosophical or non-philosophical creativity? How does philosophy which has always been directed towards the whole, the general, the absolute and the truth, stop in the face of a crisis? No matter how harsh it is, it is a wound that will not heal soon, and a temporary distress that must be relieved. The reader has the right to raise these questions and doubts, and to strive to imagine the contradiction in other forms or formulations, without the need to digress from the connection of philosophy to its spatial, temporal, and social context, and about philosophers always starting from this world, and from this direct reality with its things, assets, events, relationships, values, etc. I say, yes, from here and now philosophical creativity begins before moving forward in the journey of abstracting, generalizing, synthesizing, criticizing and evaluating the issues, positions and problems that the Arab person lives and suffers at this moment in its Arab history, and the history of the world as a whole.50 from the experiences of this prevailing reality that he seeks to transcend and the experiences of the people who live in it, dream, suffer, hope, speak, remain silent, know, suffer, ask, die, etc. He begins formulating his general rulings and issues that are neither supported by experience nor refuted by experience, and he builds his philosophy that does not alienate itself from itself or about a reality. All true philosophers have done this implicitly or explicitly, directly or indirectly, either to rationalize this reality, or to criticize it, to resist it, and to overcome it, or to work in its flesh the blade of analysis, or to search behind it for another real reality, or to explain the laws that control its social historical movement, or to gather its fragments into a higher unity, etc. There are other patterns, currents, trends, and tendencies. Dot. The reader wonders, will the awaited innovator be guided to his method before, during, or after the beginning of his experience? I answer, he cannot, of course, experiment or think without a method and the plight of contradiction or contradiction of the plight in which he finds himself forces him to be critical, dialectical, and revolutionary. Critically, because the responsibility of the moment has placed on his shoulders the burden of radically reviewing everything, including his critical awareness, which needs continuous criticism and connection to his historical and social self, so that he is not satisfied with the perspective of the other self. Dialectically, because going beyond the prevailing, static, and fixed reality requires him to realize the logic of transformation and possibility in everything. He is revolutionary because liberation and change not consistency and correctness of interpretation alone are the final criterion used to evaluate his thought and work. It is natural for some of us to imagine other beginnings that do not contradict the necessity of beginning with our urgent issues problems and crises here and now but rather impose and stimulate them. The faithful introduction to the doctrines, schools, and major figures from the East and West, their study, and accurate and clear translation of them, while being keen to dialogue with them and take a critical stance towards them. It is a work whose creativity is undoubted, which is why it is so rare in our Arabic library. And the transfer of philosophical foundations into our language in a way that reflects mastery, understanding, and empathy, cannot be devoid of creativity. How many books have sparked intellectual revolutions revolutions among the people of the receiving language to which they were transferred. How poor and ashamed we are when we look at our language and do not find the complete and verified works of a single great philosopher. 
contributing to global philosophical efforts in the areas of specialized philosophical research, such as symbolic logic, the philosophy of mathematics, the philosophy of language theories of knowledge, the study of values, and the horizons of contemporary philosophy that have arisen as a result of amazing technical developments etc. And this is a scientific amount is almost non-existent, and the radical revisions of philosophical education that have been drowned in small conflicts, and throughout recent years, it has failed miserably in achieving the minimum level of independent critical sense among scholars, or rooting a trend, trend, or school in the conventional scientific sense. It has been dominated by imitation and rumination of the old and new, and translated writing, and authored translation, on the one hand, or the rise of slogans and ideological voices, that stifled the scientific voice on the other hand. However, the scope is narrow for raising more questions, problems, and wishes, and perhaps one day if God helps and his mercy wills, it will expand for other beginnings, stemming from the crises and contradictions that torment us here and now. Footnotes. 1. The contradiction in formal logic indicates that combining two mutually exclusive judgments is impossible. The principle of non-contradiction, which Aristotle made the supreme logical principle of thinking, is based on the fact that it is impossible for something to be said and not to be said about the same thing from the same perspective. Leibniz formulated it in the following form. A is not non-A, so that two contradictory judgments in this way, A is B, and non-A is not B, cannot be, being honest with each other. It follows from this limit that the two contradictory judgments, whether it is the positive judgment or the negative judgment, must be false. It also follows that if one of the two judgments is true, then the other judgment must be false. As for dialectical logic and dialectical metaphysics, dialectical contradiction is as old as human thought, and perhaps ancient Chinese thought was the context for formulating it in a clear image expressed by Yang, positive, and Yin, negative, which are the two poles of universal truth, or Tao, and the way of life. The wise and virtuous woman, who moves and lives with them and unites them in a unity that is impossible to describe and define. Dialectical thought driven by contradiction has a long history in many forms, which there is not enough space to simply point out. It is sufficient to mention these two phrases that distinguish it from the formal thought of Hegel's writings, to whom the greatest credit is due for formulating the principles and laws of dialectics and establishing its living, developed logical system. He says in the Theological Writings of Youth paragraphs 8 and 3. What is considered a contradiction in the kingdom of death is not so in the kingdom of life. As he says in The Science of Logic, Volume 2, 58, one of the most prominent biases into which the logic used so far falls, in addition to the usual perception, is that the contradiction in their claim is not considered an essential inner definition, just like identity. If it were in order of importance and we adhere to the separation between both definitions, which are contradiction and identity, then the contradiction would be more deserving of being taken as the deeper and more fundamental source. This is because identity, compared to it, is nothing more than simple direct definition or dead existence, while contradiction is the root of all movement and all vitality, and to the extent that a thing contains in itself contradiction, it moves and has momentum and effectiveness. See the Dictionary of Philosophical Concepts by Prof. Professor Hoffmeister, Hamburg, Minor, 1955 AD, pages 589 to 690, as well as the dialectical method according to Hegel by Dr. Imam Abdul Fattah Imam, the second chapter on the sources of the Hegelian dialectic, Cairo, Dar al Maruf, pages 39 to 96. 2. Robert Hayes, The Logic of Contradiction, A Treatise on Method and Philosophy, and the Validity of Formal Logic, Berlin and Leipzig, Volturdi Gruppeter, 1932, pages 2024, pages 7181. Heiss Rupert, Logic des Weitersprüches, Untersuchung zur Methode der Philosophik und zur Gültigkeit der Formalen Logik Berlin und Leipzig, Walter de Greiter 1932, page 224, 7181. 3. Descartes, Second Meditations and Replies, Adam and Tannery ed. Part VI, pages 140, 189. Likewise, Descartes' Conversation with Bormann, in the fifth volume of the same edition, page 147. Descartes' Meditations because de responses, ed. Adam et Tannery vol VI p 189, 14. V, page 147. 4. It is known that Descartes stated in various places in his writings, that his approach was different from that of Aristotelian logic, and that he intensified his criticism of this logic, which was limited to proving the facts that we knew before. It is clear that what is meant by this is a formal analogy, 
That is why he says in his second collection of responses to his critics that the task of his approach on the contrary is to show the correct way in which to reveal the subject in a systematic way as if it had been discovered in a priori way. It is known that he indirectly expressed the method he followed in his meditations. See the previous reference, volume 7, page 155, 5 Schultz, Heinrich, The Cartesian Cogito, Journal of Kantian Studies, Vol. 36, page 132, cited by Robert Hayes, Op. Sit, pages 73-75, Scholz, Heinrich Huber das Cogito, Ergosum, Constudian, 1931, Zxvi S. 123.6 Six credit for proposing this hypothesis goes to the historian of modern philosophy known as Ben Erdmann, in his study of the idea of the critique of pure reason published in the research of the Berlin Academy in 1917 AD, mentioned by Hayes, Op. Sit, page 25, Erdmann, Benno, Die Idee on Kant's Kritik der Reinen Vernunft Abhandlungen der Berliner Akademik, 1917. 7 Kant, Academy Edition, Volume 12, Second Edition, pages 227 ff, Kant, Work, Academic Osgood BD.XII2, Offilage, S 287F.8B 739, from the second edition of 1787 AD, Critique of Pure Reason. 9B 535, it is noted that things in themselves are an unsuccessful expression, because the thing in itself that Kant means, that is the absolute truth, of which phenomena in the world of sense are manifestations, cannot be a thing. 10B 825. 11B 354. 12. B 354 onwards. 13. B 768. 14. B 823. 15. B 697. 16. B 823. 17. B. 18. B 790. 19. B XX translation from the manuscript referred to in a previous footnote, and the underlying words are highlighted in the original with separate letters. 20. Hegel, Phenomenology of Spirit, Introduction, Page 4, Commemorative Edition, Hegel, Phenomenologie des Geists, S4, Jubilum Sauce Gabe. See also the author, Why Philosophy, Alexandria, Manchet L. Moruff, 1981, page 35, 21 Hegel, Science of Logic, Commemorative Edition, Part I, page 50, page 260. Hegel, Wissenschaft der Logik, S5, Jubel am Osgab. 22, the compound of identity and difference according to Hegel is opposition, and opposition reaches its peak and becomes contradiction. If the first challenges of thought made identity, diversity, and opposition principles, what is meant here are the three laws of formal logic, which are identity contradiction, and the third in the nominative case, these principles must rather be understood and formulated in one law, namely the law of contradiction that fuses them all. And it must be said all things are contradictory in themselves, and contradiction expresses the truth and essence of things, and it is absurd to say that contradiction cannot be thought about. The only thing true in this statement is that contradiction is not the end, rather, it cancels itself, but when it cancels itself, it reaches a higher idea, which is the basic category that unites the category of identity and the category of difference, and distinguishes between them at the same time. See Dr. Imam Abdul Fattah Imam, The Dialectical Method, according to Hegel from paragraph 203 to paragraph 223, pages 219 to 223, Cairo, Dar al Maraf, Library of Philosophical Studies, ed. T. 23 for the introduction to the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, 24 is for the fact that logic has followed this safe path since ancient times. This is clear from the fact that says that since the time of Aristotle, it has not retreated a single step backward if we ignore the deletion of some details that have no weight and the introduction of more precise definitions to its discussions. Overall, this is more about improving formulation than about scientific certainty. What is also strange about logic is that it has not yet been able to advance a single step forward and that all phenomena indicate that it has reached its completion and perfection from the same introduction mentioned in the previous footnote. 25 Hegel, Science of Logic, Vol. 1, page 48, 26 Hegel, Ibid, pages 51 at sec. 27 Kant, Critique of Pure Reason, Next Edition 58b 58. 28 Hegel, Science of Logic, 154 would it 54. 29 Hegel, Lectures on the History of Philosophy, Commemorative Edition, Part I, page 127 and then Hegel, Vor Sungen über die Geschichte der Philosophie, Jubilum Sosga, Band I, S 127f. 30 same, page 24. 31 Ibid, Part 3, page 687. 
32 Hegel Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences, Commemorative Edition, page 38, Hegel Encyclopedia Jubilomsgub, S3.8.33, The comprehensive idea, the living idea, and the idea of an idea, are all attempts to express the difficult original term begriff in English and French concept, idea. The argument of Hegelian and dialectical logic in Arabic Dr. Imam Abdel Fattah translates it as the comprehensive idea, then he defines it by saying, it is the third circle of logic, it is also the compound in every triangle, and the concrete idea is a comprehensive idea, hence, the concept of becoming is the first comprehensive idea. The comprehensive idea of a thing is its rational nature, and it is also synonymous with pure reason and the entire system of logic, Hegel's Dialectical Method page 99, page 400. Therefore, when Hegel says that the growth or progress of the comprehensive idea is what I call method, by idea here, he means reason and its full development, hence, all contradiction disappears between what he sometimes says, that the dialectical method is an expression of the nature and essence of the mind, and what he sometimes says, that it is the comprehensive idea, or the progress of this idea in its various stages, I bet, page 100, 34, logic, 153, 35, logic, 154. 36 Husserl, Logical Research, Part 1, Second Edition, 1913, page 228. The underlying words are separated in the original. Husserl, Logic Schonersehungen, BD, I, 2, Offledge, 1913, S22. 37 Intellectual abstraction is the transformation of the material in the world into an essence, idea, or ideal. Dr. Antoine J. Cowry translates it as the AIDS. See his article on the components of the Phenomenological Method, Journal of Contemporary Arab Thought, Special Issue on the Problem of the Method, Issue 8 to 9, Beirut, December January, 1981 AD, pages 29 to 48. 38 Previous Reference Part 1, pages 229 at sec. 39 Ideas, 2nd Edition, 1922, page 113. Ideen zu einer ein Phänomenologie in Phänomenologischer Philosophie, August 2, 1922, Husserlina, BD. Dot. 40 See the opinion of one of Husserl's direct students on this problem in the article translated by the author and published by the magazine Fusel in its issue on literary criticism and the humanities. Jurd Brandt, The World, History and Myth, pages 107 to 115, Volume 4, Issue 1, 1983. 41 I have been unable to access the original text of this book, which occupies the sixth volume of Husserl's popular series. Die Krasis der Euroapischen Wissenschaften und die Trano und Phänomenologie, HRSG, WBML, 1954. Husserl Lionel B.D. Vidot. Therefore, I relied on the valuable article about him by Dr. Hassan Hanafi, and on his article on Husserl's Phenomenology of Religion in his book Contemporary Issues Part 2. Cairo, Dar al Fikr al Arabi, 1977 AD, pages 298 and after. 42 Previous Reference, page 298. 43 Ibid, page 312. 44 Ibid, page 318. 45 C Drive, I'm an Abdel Fattah's book on the development of controversy after Hegel, Beirut, Dar al Tanwir, 1985, in three volumes, as well as his previously mentioned book on Hegel's dialectical method, pages 316 to 366, about his opinion on the correct interpretation of materialist or Marxist dialectic. The second part of his book is about Kierkegaard, the pioneer of existentialism, especially the second chapter on the dialectical development of the self in its four stages, the third chapter on the diseases of the self, despair, anxiety, and sin, and the first chapter of the fourth chapter on paradox, Cairo, 1986 AD. See also the Philosophical Dictionary, edited by Professors Georg Klaus and Matfried Bohr, Lessing, Biological Institute, Part 2, pages 1161-1171, Dialectical Material, as well as the book Pfeiffer's Dialectical Logic, translated by Professor Ibrahim Fathi, Dialectical Thought, Its Nature and Forms, by the author from the manuscript. 46 See the previously mentioned issue of the Journal of Contemporary Arab Thought, especially Professor Muta Safadi's article on the Arab project between problematization and acculturation, pages 4 to 22. Likewise, Dr. George Zanani's article on the transfer of Western methodologies to the Arab world and the problem of the curriculum in which doctors and professors Nasif Nasser, Mana Al Sol, Joseph Magazel, and Muta Safadi participated, pages 183 to 193. 
47 In this regard, see the valuable book by Dr. Mohamed Zaydan, Methods of Philosophical Research, Beirut, Beirut Arab University, 1974 AD, along with various issues of Alam al-Fikra magazine, Kuwait, on method in the natural, mathematical, and human sciences, and many important books on the philosophy of science, especially the book Dr. Muhammad Abdi al-Jabri. In addition to his applications of the cognitive structural approach in his studies on heritage and the formation and structure of the Arab mind, the book The Concept of Text and other books by Dr. Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid and a large number of studies published in this magazine that are difficult to enumerate. 48 See the recent article by one of the figures of the contemporary Arab Enlightenment, Dr. Fawad Zakaria, The Visibility of Enlightenment, Ibda Magazine, Cairo, No. 4, April 1991, and the reference here is to the book The Dialectic of Enlightenment, which was co-authored by the Frankfurt School philosophers Horkheimer and Adorno. 49 Muhammad Abdi al-Jabri, We in Heritage, Beirut, Dar al-Talaya, 1998, page 9. 50 Shukri Muhammad Ayyad, this talk about the crisis of the Arab mind, Al-Hilal magazine, March 1991, pages 8-14.